Hi, I'm David Byrne. I'd like to invite you on an adventure. I've co-created a new immersive show called Theater, Theater of, the, of the, mind. the Mind. Our guides will lead you through a series of experiences you'll see, feel, taste, and hear to examine how we perceive the world and how we shape our identities. It's all inside your head. But is any of it real? Find out starting August 31st. Tickets at theaterofthemindenver.com. Hey there, ghosties. Welcome to episode 99 of the Ghost Lights podcast. As we fast approach episode 100, I wanted to take some time to sit down with just some of the Davids taking you on a tour of Theater of the Mind. We sat down this week with Steph Holmbo, Janae Burris, and Maggie Whittem. We talked, of course, about how theater happened to them, but also about their specific process on this journey and the importance of knowing your worth. But before we begin, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the tragedy that happened to us all in Colorado Springs this weekend. It seems that every day we are given some fresh reminder of how difficult it is to just be alive, to just be a person in this country and in this world. And I hope as Thanksgiving approaches, we'll take a moment to acknowledge the things that you love, the people you love, and the things that make you shine. They should belong to us all. I love you. And now Dan, give us war by the Hypnotic Brass Ensemble. Ghosties, this is episode 99. We are fast approaching, maybe not that fast, like a turtle. We are approaching episode 100, but before we get to that milestone, I have had the good fortune of snagging some of our Davids from Theater of the Mind, a show that, if you haven't heard already, I think we can announce it now, is being extended through January, January 22nd. So if you haven't gotten your tickets, you've got more chances to do so. To go on this wild ride with myself on occasion, Janae Burris, Stephanie Halombo, and Maggie Whittem. I hope I pronounced all those names correctly. (laughs) Hello, everyone. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi. How the heck are we this evening? (laughs) (laughs) We're all doing Doing well, yes? Yeah. Fantastic. This is a little different. The last time I did a... uh, a round table discussion. It was, I, I, it was also through zoom and then I didn't record it and then had to do individual interviews that same day to try and sync it all up together. So it was a very fun time. This one, I have you all here. We're recording it on two levels. So if it's not any good, it's because of me <laughs> and I just screwed up on my end. So with that, um, I want to start this podcast. Like I do every podcast So feel free to, you know, answer as you do. Uh, when you feel the, the the void of silence being long enough, you want to jump in. Theater, how did it happen to you? Steph, I'll start with you. I grew up in a very artistic family. My dad was a composer, a pianist, and a vocalist. My mom was an actress and a singer. And um, they didn't do those things for money really my dad was a pastor at a church my mom ran a daycare but it always felt like something one could pursue and so in the third grade my I grew up in a tiny town on the east coast and um they were having auditions for the school play Rumpelstiltskin Mm. and most people auditions were in the library and so I understand podcasting is a audio medium but you can imagine everybody who gets up has their little pieces of paper they open up their sheet they read their monologue and then they sat down most of the women auditioning for the princess you know the four boys who were on the rug auditioning for the prince the prince and Rumpelstiltskin and um I got up with a fully memorized monologue to audition for Rumpelstiltskin I had some choreography I booked the 
titular role. And um, that was it for me. I was like, this is what I will do for the rest of my life. And, um, and like, you know, Rumpelstiltskin, what a way to begin it all. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Maggie, how's by you? I love that origin story, Steph. <laughs> um, so yeah, kind of similar. I grew up in a household that really valued the arts. My dad made a point. I grew up in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which is like three hours northwest of Denver. And my dad made a point to like bring me down to Denver and go to shows at the Denver Center and the opera and the ballet from when I was like nine years old. Uh, I remember going on these big mega road trips. We're going to go to the big city and see see the amazing things they have there. And, and uh, I wanted to be an actor. I remember seeing Merchant of Venice, I think, when I was like 10 or The Tempest and just being blown away by it. And I went to Perry Mansfield Performing Arts Camp when I was a kid, which is in Steamboat. It's actually the longest running performing arts summer camp in the country. I founded by two women who uh, founded it in 1913. One was a dancer, one was uh, an actor. And um, yeah, so I went there like through childhood and adolescence. I did, I was the theater geek in high school and uh yeah, I was hooked. Mm. Janae? I did not necessarily come from a performing arts family, but um, uh, I did get to go see a lot of live shows, theater and dance when I was a kid. I was in a, like, you know, I grew up in South Central and I was at one of those schools that people were nice to us. They give us free tickets, you know, pet, mm. pet the poor little black kids on the head, but, you know, <laughs> parade us through the after party, but still we got to go. So um, I got to see a lot of live shows when I was a kid and I was just like, I want to do that. And um, remember the TV show Fame? Yes. Loved it, wanted to go to that school. So ended up going to Cal Arts uh, in co for college, Cal Arts in Valencia, California. And then, um, you know, oh, I did some summer theater. It just, and I, I took some classes at my community college for way too long. I dropped out of high school and then went to a community college and just took theater classes and, um, went from being super duper shy to just like being like no I want to do this and just like kind of like willing myself to show up to auditions and you know doing it that way and yeah. theater school and then lots of stand-up comedy in Denver and then finally worked my way back to the theater in Denver. I, I definitely want to touch on your your stand-up background but you you mentioned something you, you found the confidence to know, I guess maybe you found a different way of being than what you described as being shy. I'm assuming through this work, what what was it that pulled that out of you more, or or I should I should I guess helped you fit into more of yourself? Um, I the I kept wanting to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my desire grew year after year. The, I in high school. I remember one teacher trying to help me learn a monologue and I was just so shy. He was dancing around doing this Shakespeare monologue in front of me. It was Portia from, I don't know if it was Merchant, but anywho, I couldn't get my voice out of my throat. It was stuck. My high school had a big theater program, like a big um, musical theater program mm -hmm. that I couldn't get into because it was, you know, I, I was too shy and I, I was just scared. But anywho, um, at the community college, I... Uh, went to I showed up for an audition and the person who auditioned me was the head of the department he was like have you ever taken a class hmm. why don't you take a class <laughs> so I got my little ensemble role in the skin of our teeth and I had two lines the people are trampling one another what was my other line I can't think of it no I had two characters one line Oh. Two characters, one line. <laughs> I was a photographer and I was a muse. And the, my line was the people are trampling one another and I never could get it out of my voice. I'll go, the people are trampling one another. <laughs> they say louder today. The people are trampling one another. And I couldn't get it out. Anywho, I took classes and, um, you know, the confidence through, through, uh, grew through classes. So 
community college. Um, I did theater in Salinas, California for a season. And then my friends that I met there were like, we're auditioning at Cal Arts. You should audition. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I auditioned and got in and thus. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, to find that voice, both <laughs> literally and figuratively. Yeah. Just through, I mean, just you being given the opportunities, but then you also cons consistently seeking it out and not, yeah, and not my allowing heart it. wanted to be there, even though that fear was like, mm. it was debilitating. Just like, I, I know a lot of people have fears, the same fear that you have of spiders or, you know, that you just, you're paralyzed. Yeah. And you just can't get your voice out and you're shaking. But my brain kept saying, I know I can do this. Like logic, the logic of it, Mm -hmm. the um you know like figuring out math i was figuring out performance in my head and being like i know i can do this yeah. so, so it took some time and, and i do well in classes i love performing arts classes i i do uh summer camp i similar to uh maggie i didn't go to summer camp but i used to teach theater summer camp teach theater summer camp. i don't know i was a camp director hey. with theater camp so i went to two weeks to of summer learning. camp and i cried in the shower that's about it Oh, <laughs> no, no, no one, no one told me that uh, swim trunks were optional in the shower. So I was, it was a communal shower. I was terrified. Oh, <laughs> and we, the, a terrifying insight into my sexual history. All right, yeah. moving right this along. This tracks. This makes so much sense. <laughs> it all makes sense. Wow, so many questions <laughs> unasked but answered. <laughs> Yeah, it does, doesn't it? So, Steph, <laughs> you talked about having a supportive uh, family in the arts. What what does that do for you as you start? I mean, during any portion of an artist's life, I feel like there's a lot of self-doubt that kind of creeps in. It, it, so often we are asking or we are being asked to show sides of us that other people spend years cultivating ways to to not expose you know we do a lot of self-exploration and have to learn like how is it having that support within the home like how does that buoy you and, and help you when you're struggling with you know should I be pursuing this those types of questions it's really incredible on one hand I I decided I was going to NYU when I was eight years old and I told my mom when I was 17 that that's the only school I was applying to. And she thought that that was a bad idea and I did it anyway and then got in. And so it, that is just an example of how sure I was that this was it and that everything would just fall into place if I just worked hard because I was watching my parents work really hard, both at their craft on their downtime during their downtime as well as at their jobs mm -hmm. hard work was a huge value of my family and so I just thought performing would be similar because they supported me and they worked hard and so all I had to do was be the one who woke up the earliest who went to as many classes as possible who was in the right place at all of the times and so yeah on one side of things great didn't have a lot of doubt that, that was the path I was taking but it does become very challenging when we don't live in a meritocracy. It's especially this performing arts industry isn't just about hard work. That's definitely an element, but there's also a lot of other things um, that are included. And so I was living in New York past college. Uh, my student loans were out of control. I was working four jobs, sleeping 10 hours a week and thinking like, I just have to work harder and then I will achieve my dreams because everybody told me if I worked hard, I would get what I wanted. And it took me becoming very ill and um, forming a, a really deathly addiction to mm -hmm. say, my life matters more than a dream. The current situation of my existence matters more than what might happen in the future and you can still have art and performance and expression while taking care of yourself which 
um, as much as I love my family, sometimes I would watch my dad play, write hours into the night rather than getting sleep. And I thought as a kid, that's what it takes. You just stay up until four in the morning and then you get up at seven for your job. And look, he loves what he does. And not a lot of rest or rejuvenation was much of a value in my upbringing. So it is great to value the arts. I want every family, every person to value the arts, especially um, in community to go support each other and to tell kids they can do whatever they want, be whoever they wanna be. And with my singular focus, it became very challenging to also take care of my current state in service of the dream, of the performance, of the goal that the world says, well, you have to be this to be a performing mm -hmm. artist. You, your career has to look this way. You have to achieve this level of success for you to be considered a working artist. Mm -hmm. That's, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the models that we've set for ourselves in so many walks of life of, benchmarks and and for other uh, you can use a, a number of metaphors to kind of describe this path if i'm not here then what am i doing right and you finding in this space now it feels like when i like and i'm and i'll do this throughout the the pod tonight is i'll, I'll reference like things that i get to witness as the understudy in the room i, I find your steph your ability to take ownership of the questions that you have in a moment and like be emboldened to ask them, even if you're not quite sure as you deliver it, because you would, you, you'd vocalize that um, really was eye opening for me to see how an actor, an artist supports themselves on a process. Sam, question. Yes. Go for since, it. Since all of us around here, can we listen? Can we laugh and listen and, well, I'm listening, obviously. <laughs> can we listen? Can we listen? <laughs> it's, or is this private between you two? No. Uh, when this you're is flattering a panel Stephanie, discussion. Should I be jealous? No. Um, no, no, no. You're all going to get it. You're all going to get okay. it. Okay. I don't, I don't want to have Ezra all being loud and stuff, but I, <laughs> I am like putting it on mute, but I'm like laughing and listening. And this is so enlightening about Stephanie. This is like amazing to learn. I saw her in a um, hundred days at Aurora Fox Theater. She was great. Didn't even know that was her. So somehow she transformed. I didn't even know. I mean, I was like, that was some other talented woman with curly red hair. In I Denver. was shooing stuff away <laughs> from a bar in Miner's Alley for like three months. And I had no idea that that was the person that was in the room with me when we stepped in for the first read. I was like, I think I know that person, but do I know that person? <laughs> but yeah, and, she's very focused in the rehearsals. I can see that now. I get it. it this yeah, is all just making yeah. too much sense to me now. I see it. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, yes, please laugh, listen, interrupt, call me out if you're like, that's a bullshit question, Sam. <laughs> Definitely, definitely jump in for that. That's that's all good pod fodder. If we were in the room together, there'd be this nice oval table, um, and we would all be sitting at it. And there would probably be bottles on the table as well, and club soda, and the like. All these, all these good things. Um, Maggie, a question mm -hmm. for you. You mentioned a similar, similar background. The support, the the pursuit of seeing these things in the arts just for your own personal experience, how does it make you feel in this moment now to be one of those people that someone is, you know, driving across the city to come see? Oh man, Sam, I am so proud. I'm so, so, so proud of the, the show and the fact that I am in the show. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I went to college and studied drama and then I lived about a decade of my life, you know, getting life experience. And then I went to graduate school and then I had a stroke after my first semester mm -hmm. <clears throat> and had to drop out. And I thought my life is over. My career is over. 
I'm never gonna be on stage again. Um, and I didn't act for a couple of years. And then I met Regan Linton, who is a wonderful, amazing person and used to be the artistic director of Family Theater Company, which only casts actors with disabilities. And I started doing a little bit with Pam and feeling like, okay, I'm gonna like inch my way back into this, maybe. <laughs> and did a couple of shows and then this opportunity to audition for the workshop of Theater of Mind came up, Theater of the Mind came up in 2019 and Reagan said, you should submit for that. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know about that. I don't know about that because I had only worked at family up until that point. And like, I am a very disabled person. Like there's, I got a lot going on, right? Um, so casting me is a big choice, I would say. Um, but I auditioned and then I got it. And I was like, holy, are you kidding me? Like, wow. <laughs> and then I did the workshop and the workshop was so much fun. And then, you know, the show was maybe going to happen in 2020. And then, you know, but maybe who knows if you were going to be able to be in it, right? And audition mm -hmm. and stuff. So I auditioned for the full production on March 12th, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that was such a day. Anyways, and then everything happened, right? COVID happened, everything happened. It's like, is it going to happen? And again, I don't know. And then it happens and now it's happening. And mm -hmm. I'm like, it's every day I'm astounded. I'm astounded at my good fortune. I'm bursting with pride that I get to be in the show. And yeah, I love it. Mm. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Maggie, I, did I, you, were you going to go to, were you going to grad school for theater? Yeah. Mm. Classical acting. Yeah. Getting my MFA. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned the, the thought that you had that there was a moment where you thought, oh no, this is not going to happen for me so, there, Maggie. Yeah. Well, I mean, I thought nothing was going to happen for me. I thought my whole life was over. Nothing, you know, my professional life, my social life, my artistic life, all my money is gone. Like my relationship is over. I was engaged at the time. Like everything is a total catastrophe and yeah. nothing will ever be good again, you know, mm. but it's so good right now. It's so Absolutely. good. I, 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 I want to, if you don't mind, I, I wonder how did you build, build those things back in? Did you have to, did anything actually end or was it just, a no, you know, I, I, you are touching on something that I know me and my, my heart of hearts that if I got hit with that, I would be in the same boat mentally. I'd be like, I, I'm, I may naturally can be I'm, I'm quick to be a downer so like if that were to happen to me I would definitely sit in that and and to see and hear you talk about the progress to see you in this moment now like how did you get there well you know you ask if anything did actually end and I feel like you know something did end and my former life ended and that's one of the reasons I love theater of the mind so much Mm -hmm. And it's this idea of memory and perception and identity and who are we really? And are we the same person that we were yesterday? And we're not, you know, I'm actually changing every day. I'm a slightly different person at the beginning of this podcast than I will be at the end of this podcast. And like the person that I was when I was 33 and I was like, you know, thinking that I had life all figured out and like on this trajectory of going to do this and accomplish this and have this and stuff. And, you know, I had this beautiful physical self, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I was very proud of, but, um, you know, I had to let that person go. I had to let go of what I thought she might be and what I thought she might have mm -hmm. in her life. And, 
that's okay. I lost her, but she's gone now. And it's okay. Cause we all lose our former selves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm, that's a, that's a good, that's a beautiful mindset. Thank you for sharing that Maggie. Hell yeah. Um, you've been the first one to kind of talk about Wait, I'm specific curious. Go ahead. I'm curious about um, Maggie's uh, workshop yeah. experience. Is that moving too fast? Yeah. Because I, I think yeah. I auditioned maybe on March 10th or 11th. And it was, you know, the same thing. If you're like, oh, sh shit, now this isn't happening. But I was not invited to the yeah. workshop. So yeah. um, um, can you tell I had an admin previous. That was 2019. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I never even heard of the workshop. So how, how was how was that for you? It was cool. It's the first thing I did outside of family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were still kind of working on the idea. Did you, when you came into the play that we're in now, did you, were you able to bring a, that experience into the play that we're actually in now? Or was it like, oh gosh, it's nothing like that. No. There's a lot, there's a lot of some, I mean, David Byrne has said, you know, he's working on it for eight years. <laughs> so it's, it's a long, long time coming. I wonder, I'm going to transition now, how individually this process was for you. Um, I think my, yeah, exactly the question that I wrote down 30 minutes before you all logged in. Um, what was the process for you on this piece? Janae, I'd like to start with you. How did you go about being in the room and cultivating your David? Well, when I auditioned, I had no baby. So I am a different person, similar <laughs> to Maggie. I totally feel you on this idea of like, not the same person at all. When Grady sent that email, I was like, yes, I'd love to be part of it, but... I'm gonna have a baby by then, so uh, let's see. Um, so walking in, I was nervous as heck. It was a you know first time being like, okay, this job's about to start that I've been looking forward to for so long, um, and now I'm doing it, and my mind's on this baby at home. Mm -hmm. My mind's on when am I gonna get to leave to go pump. So I didn't feel fully present. I felt really anxious in the first rehearsal. I felt behind, like when I was in school, it's so crazy to hear, um, amazing to hear Stephanie's story. And it's like, yes, this makes sense with her personality. I totally get it. You remind me of my best friend from college, hardworking. And then you discover that this industry doesn't necessarily reward um, hard work like they should. Mm -hmm. But anywho, I, um, when I was in school, I used to miss a lot of school in elementary school. Just like I was late to everything as you know. Uh, you might have figured out now, I've always been late my whole life. I've been absent for things. I would show up to class and it'd be like, did I miss the reading? Did I even get that assignment? I'm, you know, I'm figuring now like it's ADHD that uh, people didn't know about back in the eighties. Uh, but, you know, I walked into this rehearsal, like I'm sure I'm behind. I just don't know how far behind. And it was like, nope, this is the script's pretty new. <laughs> We're changing it. Doesn't even matter if you read it already because it's changing. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because I have not had time to really read this thing. I've skimmed it. I've looked at the videos and I hadn't had time to study it and break it down. I hadn't learned my lines yet. Um, and I know, Sam, you're really good at learning. You learned your lines fast. And I listened to your episode with Sko. And I was like, yeah, that's Sam. And it was like, I just did not have the brain space for it what I had envisioned in 2019 when I auditioned, I could still see myself in my beautiful body that I auditioned with. I was like, ooh, David Burns was in the room. I'm bringing it. <laughs> and then to show up to this and I was kind of a mess and without sleep and, you know, extra weight and thinking about that damn white suit. And I just was not present. I was not ready. I felt intimidated felt nervous. I felt the imposter syndrome creeping up on me. Like, you know, if they cast these people, what spectacular things have they done that I haven't done? You know, how is it, you know, I'm sure they deserve to be here and I do not. And they're being, they're throwing me a bone, which nobody does. Charlie Miller don't work like that. He ain't throwing you no bones. Um, 
And it, it's been amazing yeah. to grow with these folks and to see why all of us with our unique talents have been chosen for this role and, and what's similar about us that puts us in this role. And um, yeah. it's been quite the journey and it's, I'm so grateful to now know the lines in the way that I have decided to learn the lines. <laughs> I know my lines. I don't know anybody else's lines. I know my you make, lines. You make it sound like you got pages in the rooms with you. I, I got pages in the room? Yeah. You just like pull out a page like, oh just yeah. Just written on her forearm. Yeah. Skull, just now, in the dark. I, it was the I, 80s. I know my lines because I know when I listen to other people, I go, oh yeah, that line. I haven't been saying that at all. I heard Stephanie say, um, uh, uh, how could I have forgotten this? Or did I forget? No, did I forget about this in the attic? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. I'm get that one. Back in my David, my David gonna say that line too. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know my lines. If I had to do Stephanie's yeah. show, I would not get it right, so. Janae, you touched on something uh, near the tail end of that I really I want to I want to dig into a little bit. You the the things that um, are similar amongst all of us, like a trait that you see in the group of Davids. What is it for you, or what are the things that you see kind of being the connective tissue between the fourteen of us? Uh, I'm gonna say probably the thing that we universally have confidence. I think each actor who's in the role is brave enough to do the role. Mm -hmm. And we can go, each of us can own a room. We can go in and go, you know, yeah. fuck it. I'm in charge. Yeah. And that's necessary. You can't be a background player. You can't be, um, you know, you gotta be a little fearless. You know, and you mentioned Stephanie asking questions and in rehearsals. She'd be like, no, clear this, clear this shit up. I need to know this. But that's what builds confidence for her. It's like, Absolutely. give me all the details. You don't have all the details. No. Give me everything you got. Then tell me. So I am very well prepared and I have all of my tools. I'm the total opposite in that. I'm like, I'm not asking questions because then you might give me the answer that I don't really want. I'm going to go in and I'm going to wing it. And I'm not going to be wrong because you never did tell me what to do. But on either side of that coin, we have the confidence to say, now I'm going in and I'm about to do this. I have what I need and I'm going to do it. And mm -hmm. I'm not afraid and I'm gonna make eye contact with all these strangers. And, yeah. you know, maybe the lights didn't work today. Maybe the, you know, your hat wasn't hanging where it was supposed to be, yeah. but I am in charge of this show. Maybe they and gave you somebody else's suit. Yeah. Oops. Not me. One time, Sorry, one time Donnie. I did put on Stephanie's jacket or pants or something. I was like, oh, she way smaller than me. Oh. I was, I well, one even... time they put a different hat when we grab our hat in the show, they put they put my hat on somebody else's. And so our I shout out to the crew. Shout out to the SMs and the EAs and the crew. What a fucking team. Just yeah. so incredible. So Jay, one of our amazing crew members grabs a hat that Jay knows is also my size. I have a I have a normal head and I have a shit ton of hair. So I need a very large hat. So Jay investigates the hats and goes, oh, well, Janae has the same size hat as Steph. So I'll just put this, maybe Janae. You can use Sam. You can use Sam. So anyway, I wore your hat one day. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> my hat. Nice. Nice. <laughs> that's, that's okay. As you should. I, I I do wash before every show. So. Oh shit. I don't. But I, you know that 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 unique quality that not unique but that quality that we all share. It makes me want to go watch everybody's show. Every I'm like you know should I get a babysitter and just go watch it, or should I stay late and watch the next show? This baby really is driving my whole. It's a totally different way of being an artist now, but. I am so curious when I am setting up in my space to um, start my show. Mm -hmm. I like to go see who's in um, El Cerebro and I go watch everybody's El Cerebro. And I'm just like, I'm stealing that and I'm still that. And nice. Yeah. You, 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 you mentioned the baby changing things. And 
I don't understand that at all. Well, it's just it's just another Imagine small. Imagine trying to do what you're doing with no time to do it. Oh, I, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, and you'd yeah. be like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna show up anyway. <laughs> I'll see what happens. We're just gonna see what happens. We're just gonna raise this baby out here in the world. What is that? The oven? We got a new oven. Yeah, it's you know, I, yeah. the last time I did a play, at, not the last time, but I did a one woman show at, at Aurora Fox, and. Mm. That's my oven. There's no way I could have done it with a baby because it mm -hmm. just took all of me. Yeah. And so I went to this show thinking, I cannot do this because I need to give all of me. And it's like, uh, you're a pro. You'll figure it out. You're a Absolutely. pro. Absolutely. You are definitely a pro. Steph, what was your process like? How did you approach this piece? Uh, I will talk about my biggest fear first, which is... Oh, good. It's one of my questions. Um... I was very, very nervous about my tendency to compare mm -hmm. and knowing we were all going to have the same script, the same outfit, the same amount of time, the same set, the same science experiments. I was like, they, all I'm going to do is watch that other person and think that they're better than me. Even if they're making different choices, even if they look totally different, that has been because we'll go back to this value of hard work. I'm like, well, I, I'll just work harder and then people will want me. And like, again, hard work is great. And we all bring some like spicy flavor. And that's what's incredible about the arts is yes, you can work hard. And if they're looking for a specific thing, they're going to go with that specific thing because that makes the show better. That makes the movie better. That makes the music better, whatever it is. And so I had done some work before we got into the room and then we got into the room and I saw this incredible slab of artistic, intelligent people. And I just thought like, when we get on our feet, I'm gonna have to do some intense like inner work to not suddenly be like, well, theirs is better than me and I should just quit. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, especially once we got into those round robins and when I started witnessing people's shows um I had a delightful conversation with Christina Fontaine who's another one of our Davids yep. um because sometimes we carpool and I had seen oh, her show and I was just like this show your show is incredible it's so unique it's so you it's lived in it's full it's emotional it takes a journey from beginning to end and she happened to be in my show the next night when we did our first um, audience previews. And she just is really gentle and sweet and incredible and, and said such authentic things, not just like complimentary things. I mean, compliments are great, right? Like, yeah. tell me my face is pretty. But also Christina was saying things like, your show is you. And so I not only feel like each person in this cast was witnessing other people's work from a place of, what are you gonna do? I can't wait. I can't wait to see how you interpreted this. I can't wait to see how, how you move from door to door. But I think the, the energy starts from the top and Sko created this environment where he valued all 14 of us and the versions we gave David Wise and the movements we created and the intention we had behind things. And I just, I think it would have been impossible to do those things without a director who was so generous. Yeah. And I saw that through the eyes of every other cast member that when I had a cast member in my room, when I was in their room, it was just this environment of you're going to do something incredible because you're incredible. And, you know, there's this cheesy phrase, you are enough. And I felt like we all journeyed through this winding river of, of arriving at, yeah, my David is the David that they wanted in this show. And I'm just going to show up as me. I'm going to say the lines that are written and I'm going to I'm going to be me inside of this process. And my David can't look like Maggie's, can't look like Janae's, can't look like Sam's. And that is valued here. 
which I don't always find is valued in artistic versions of things. Um, sometimes I have felt kind of squeezed into a, a shape. Mm -hmm. And in this one, it was like, not only what shape are you in general, but what shape are you today? And that kind of freedom with boundaries, you got to be in this room for this amount of time. You got to say these lines, you got to do this experiment. Cause I think we all work well within boundaries. Uh, I think that's a really tricky environment to create. And I think this process with the people that they chose as the cast, with the crew that they chose, with the stage managers they chose and with the, with SCO at the helm, we all really took note of that and proceeded in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. I would, uh, I would definitely want to echo that. I always felt like, especially for me, understudy, uh, to mention the Cisco, I never once felt like I was on the outside looking in. I've been the understudy. I would assume some of us have as well in our lives. There are there are moments where you feel like, why am I in the room? Like uh, you, you, and then like they throw you a rehearsal after they open up the show, and then you never touch the mm -hmm. material again. Mm -hmm. And yet you have to give up so much of your time to be present for it. I like from from the word jump i was looking at it from two perspectives and then maggie i do want to i was sitting here as i was listening to stuff it's like oh this is gonna be great we're all gonna be able to talk about this and then i want to talk about my thing because i did it too but i'm also like i i gotta i was gonna save me but now i can't because i'm rambling so <laughs> i i wanted so badly to come out guns blazing I wanted to be, I wanted to come in because I've wanted this since I was in college. I mentioned it in the rehearsals, 10 years, 10 years, 11, 12 years. I've been working at getting into the Denver center. I had to come in and be fucking perfect from the start. There had to be no doubt, there had to be no doubt. And I, and I built all that energy up and I'm panicked in the park, parking lot. I read the script the night before our first read as at the table. And I'm like, I don't know. I can't do this. I can't do this. And so when we all, I, two of us already have mentioned that feeling of being an imposter as we walk into the room and the, and the, the tendency to compare is something I know all too well, Steph. It's, it, 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 rat, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a demon in my, in my shadows. Like it's just always there. Um, I think I've done it on every show that I've ever been in, in my entire life. Mm. And the ones where I've got one line and two characters. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. It's this- you know, I've played a tree about three times. You, my, they trampled on us. What's your line? The, the people are trampling one another. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, supposed to be like screamed out. Get, get, let's, um, I'm gonna take a moment here. Janae, can you say that line again? But this time you just witnessed your neighbor being trampled. Now go. Oh, in my current way of acting now? Yeah, she better act. She better act. Here we go. <laughs> I learned some acting from Stephanie in the round robins, by the way. Uh, you're gonna say it one more time. The people are trampling one another. <laughs> <laughs> I will really do too much. It's a Tony. It's a Tony for me. Absolutely. I've learned do too much, fuck it, and let the director tell you to do less. <laughs> do too much. <laughs> do too much. And they will say, that's too much. Turn it down. <laughs> Shout out to Sco, because he's been so open to all the shit we brought to this. Yes. He's never said that's terrible. He's been like, okay, give it a try. <laughs> how many how many times I ad-libbed entire portions of the script in rehearsal process? And you'll be like, nah. <laughs> It's no, funny. It's funny. No. funny. Yeah. He gets it though. That's that's the great thing about him is when you're like, I'm about to try this. Oh, I'm just joking about this. Or I'm showing a fear as an actor. And just like, he's just like funny and he gets it, you know? Sometimes Absolutely. you have directors and you're like, I'm gonna try a joke with you. Mm -hmm. But he gets it and he opens the floor to, to your interpretation. He He considers it. He has his own things that he definitely wants to see. And so it's like, no, that's not happening. Yeah. I would like it if we would all do it this way. And you're like, that is a global note. You're like, yeah. okay, global note. Mm -hmm. I heard, mm -hmm. heard. Absolutely. Uh, you didn't ask about the director, but uh, I am definitely, I just listened to your 
interview with him and talk talking about collaboration and all of that. I was just like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I uh, enjoyed. Yeah. It's an it was an important piece of this puzzle. I mean, like so to touch even more on the directors of this, and and then Maggie, I swear I'm coming to you. Um, I I had a I had a run a poor I did I did backstage in front of. I think it was Christina, James, Donnie, Annie, and Betty was the director holding space. And I just came in just like cocky as hell because I was, I knew I was off book. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show out. I gotta show out. And she gave, like, I did it the first run and she was like, I don't know what that was. Try it again. <laughs> in front of everybody. And that, that like cut me out. Like, cut all the motor. <laughs> oh man no. i don't know what that was do it again so we go out we do it again and it was better the second time through and and i had said some things i i i, I love me some me oh. so i i came into the room going like oh i'm about to show you how a real actor does this i'm joking obviously that's my energy and everyone no, no. knew i was joking you you ain't lying i've been yeah. witness yeah, I remember but, when you did El Cerebro, and then you like nailed the timing of it, and it was like, oh, and you nailed every line, every word. It was like, look at this dude showing off. Well, and it's I a lot didn't easier. Know shit at that point, I was like, look at him. Look at this understudy trying to steal my role right here. He just, look who's trying to steal my schedule. It's a lot easier though when when every actor in the room and director doesn't say anything, and they we don't have the. The, the berries to, t to sample in that room. Mm. It goes a lot faster. It goes really according to plan. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, that moment, having that with Betty, having the conversation that I had with her after the fact, from that point on, I was dialed in. Mm -hmm. and, and the work that I applied to what we were doing, it, it became less about me and how I felt I was going to be perceived through it and how how important this opportunity was just not to me as an actor at this stage of my life who quit his job a year ago, but about how this was supposed to happen because I put the work in. And so now that it's happening, I don't have to carry all of this, this bravado that I carry to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And I feel one mm -hmm. of the things that I've created through my arc as David is like, there are moments that have been and will be always performative. And I want the audience to feel that performative quality. Because when I hit them with the authentic stuff, that is a choice. That they've earned the right to see me. And I think that that's, and I might get a note about it the next time I'm audited, but like there's still a, there's still a thing there that like, Oh, that I had that experience. I was so performative in this room. Why was I performative? Ah, because I didn't have anything I need. I knew to tap into yet. I've and definitely I been called out by Betty on yeah. that. She called me out at a point where she was so right. Mm -hmm. It was like the first I had just memorized the attic, and I didn't memorize anything else yet, but I had locked in the memory and I and I, all I did was plan on performing it. And Betty called me out on it. I was like, damn, good eye, good eye. Yeah. Ezra. Well, and I think what's so beautiful about what you said, Sam, is we, we protect ourselves. And at some points we need to. And boy, isn't this work just constantly taking off the armor and being like, okay, here's my like softness. <laughs> like if you shoot an arrow, it's going straight in. And I, that's what I signed up for. Yeah. yeah. So that recognition and that beautiful vulnerability. Absolutely. Maggie, for you, what, is, what was your approach to this process? How has it changed over the course of the run? Well, uh, I was just, astounded and just so excited to do it and also like a little terrified because it's the Denver Center and uh I'm a disabled actor and what is it going to be like but also I had never done immersive theater before ever and 
I had done a lot of improv comedy in my life and also a lot of public speaking. I do public speaking about stroke and disability and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, some combination of my experience in these different things is going to come together and hopefully this is going to be great. (laughs) And I love it so much. Like just the idea of being in a room with all of these people who are strangers for the first 10 seconds, you know, Mm -hmm. but then beyond that, it's like, we're together. We're connected. We are lifelong friends. And like the story knits us together in this hour that we get to spend with each other. And I don't know, I guess I, (laughs) I didn't know exactly what it was going to be like, but I was like, thinking that kind of goal of connection and humanity and like Steph said, vulnerability, that we are just in a journey together where we're going to have this, we're just going to be friends. We're going to be together for this hour. How, how lucky am I that I get to spend an hour with these wonderful people? It's so, yeah, I guess that was my approach. (laughs) kind of philosophical um but I felt like yeah the improv my experience as an actor um in general and my public speaking experience all helped me approach this with confidence and yeah but it was all new brand new territory for me how how different did this feel for you than as opposed to uh, or I was thinking of a word to describe it. I only came up with non-immersive theater. It's something that I feel like my whole background is, you know, that type of work. And except for like the last two years, mainly through the pandemic, thanks to a great relationship that I have with the Catamounts. But how did this, how different did this feel for you, Maggie? So totally different. Holy cow. <laughs> but so much fun. I love being like right next to people. Mm. Um, it, it's so exciting. It's so alive every time, you know, I've done the show many times now. I've, I've, I do fewer performances per week than the other actors, but I've still done it a lot. And, but every time it's, it's, it's this new alive creature of itself you know this one hour that we are together Mm -hmm. absolutely Steph how about for you um well I I need you to repeat the question but before you repeat the question I just was so deeply listening to Maggie's answer that I don't remember it and that is because Maggie I find your show to be so brave and curious and that feeling you just gave us in that answer is how I feel during your show when I watch pieces of it or when I catch little audio glimpses and I'm just so deeply impressed every time I pass by a room and I'm like I'm just gonna stick around for a moment and like listen to Maggie's show because it feels so like like that joy like that wonder and like that curiosity and curiosity can be very scary and and very high risk. And I just find you dive into every room, into every relationship with your audience with that attitude. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't remember your question. No, it's no, it's totally fine. Um, how different, how how much of how different was this process as opposed to your other non-immersive work up to this point? Well, I was lucky enough. Um, to produce an immersive one woman show in the midst of the pandemic um, with a two man team with uh, directed by Courtney Esther and uh, Stuart Barr did kind of everything else. Um, he, we did it in his backyard. He created the set, he did the lighting, he did all of the tech elements and mm. he was there for every rehearsal. So um, that actually felt like 
a stepping stone into this. Now I didn't have that fear of comparison, but it was very much, I'm holding space for a group of 15 people for about 70 minutes and I'm taking what they're giving me and I'm computing it inside of me and then hopefully giving them back what they need in this moment. Um, so those processes felt deeply similar, which was both exciting and like, I know how, how very challenging this is. I'm also a uh, very much an introvert. So the outpouring of energy, it takes me to connect with somebody, pull it in and then give them something back out feels like a workout every show, mm -hmm. a good one, but a workout. Um, it, I just feel like it uses a totally different skill set than something in a proscenium, than something. I've done a lot of musical theater work. I grew up uh, it, at the beginning of my professional career. I was mostly a dancer and that is really fun and really challenging in a physical way and and hitting the mark kind of every night and and really finding your place within a group of people, both formation wise, playing off of each other on stage um, and then creating this piece that's very similar from night to night. And this is like the opposite of all of those things. You're connecting with an audience, they're your scene partner, hopefully they're up for the challenge. Hopefully the show is different every night because uh, it's an entirely different group of people. So regardless of the same room, it feels, I mean, even if you do a show at five and a show at seven, like those feel light years away. And so it felt exciting to know this is gonna be an entirely, it's like, you know, I watched the last dance during the pandemic, like most people did. Michael Jordan went from being a professional basketball player to professional baseball player and then went back. And his personal trainer was like, good luck, dude. You're going to, we have to train an entirely different group of muscles to go from baseball back to basketball. And that is how I felt in this process. I was like, okay, we are training different muscles. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I super love the, the last dance reference. Thank you so much, Steph. You're welcome. I, I took that personally. <laughs> I'm a meme. <laughs> Janae, how was this for you? You having the background in stand-up comedy, I was operating under the impression that this was not going to be a, as much of a journey as I felt it was going to be for me, trying to carry a piece essentially on your own. Yes, we get to give some to like a, a, per, a percentage of this workload to the audience, but the vast majority of it is us pushing and driving and, you know, never, never taking our foot off the gas in certain areas. How was this for you? Oh, this, this, you know what, oddly enough, uh, as a, I studied avant-garde theater and mm. then I do stand-up comedy and I feel like I'm perfect, perfectly suited for immersive work, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, this is my second time working with off, well, not my second time, but my second play with Off Center. Mm. I got to host another event, but um, that was the one thing I could cling to that could give me confidence was that I know that in immersive theater, my skills as a stand-up com comedian will, will help me be better. Like those skills will be able to be utilized. And I really appreciate it. You know, just seeing Amanda in my audition, I was like, oh God, she knows me. But also she knows some not great things. <laughs> she, know, she knows that I will not learn my lines till two days after opening. Um, but she also knows that I'm gonna do something. You know, I'm not gonna freeze up. I'm mm -hmm. going to use my skills as a comedian and connect with the audience. And, and I felt encouraged in that way. Like, nice. yeah, don't, don't, um, like whenever, when Amanda comes to audit my show, she's like, you know, in early on, she's like, as soon as you get those lines down, you know, I can't wait to see how you start to say more jokes and, mm -hmm. you know, and bring the audience in more and connect with them more once you have the confidence of being off book, because you definitely need that. Um, but stand-up comedy really lends itself to immersive theater. Even if you're not telling jokes, even if it were a more serious mm -hmm. uh, narrative that we were telling, well, the narrative part is serious, but um, just to be able to connect with an audience 
yeah. and be in the moment. You know, sometimes when you're in a regular proscenium play, we call them regular plays now instead mm-hmm. of non-immersive. They're regular plays, <laughs> regular ass play. I'm in a regular ass play, uh, <laughs> but you, you know, you really got to an immersive. Your job is to connect with the audience. We may not all, you know, our audience wants to come in and open drawers and figure out the game. And it's like, there is no game. There's no fucking drawer to open. What we're going to do is connect. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to, I want you to stay present and I'm going to yeah. stay present. And so stand up comedy certainly lean, lends itself to that. And I want to <laughs> encourage actors, especially actors who identify as females, to do some stand up comedy because it, it helps because you're already halfway there, first of all. Mm-hmm. You know how to be on stage, you know how to be present. Plus, the stand up comedy looks good on the resume. So I've noticed when, when I was just like, I study avant garde theater. I have learned, I've been doing voice lessons, blah, blah, blah. Nobody cared when I said I could do stand up. Even when I was barely starting, people were interested and gave me even more of a chance, I think. So yeah. I, I'm just curious how much of your stand up is crowd work? None of it. Not really. Wow. I, I don't do crowd work. I'm gonna tell my jokes and y'all should shut up out there. You can laugh or you can shut up. I don't do crowd work. Everybody be quiet. I got the mic. Um, I do energy work, like in that I stay present with the audience. If they groan, I respond to those. I don't do a back and forth. I'm, you know, like, you know, as an, like an improv, you ask a question, a question to the audience, you might not get the answer you want. So I don't open myself up to that. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, so in my, as my David, I don't do any crowd work. I don't do too much crowd work without the answer that I know coming. Mm. You know, I'm not going to ask any questions if I don't know the answer that they're going to give. Mm. I lead them directly to the water. Yeah, that's, I'm very much in a similar vein. I've got a couple of things that I've turned into to calls to action. A note that we got together a while, a long time ago, as we go into our first transition without spoiling anything, turning that into a call to action. And now I've, I've taken those little bits, especially in the attic, a specific moment to like, will you keep this going for us? Like asking, knowing that I'm the person I'm asking has been Johnny on the spot all night. That's the person that's getting my eyes the most. That's the person that's been there like, oh, yeah, yeah. And we did this together, like that person that's playing along, because by that point in time, I've won. I've won enough of their attention to to know that I'm going to get the answer I want. Mm, 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 mm. I want to take this moment now. We've kind of been touching on this throughout the last few minutes of our conversation. But I, I want to pose to us all, what is it like to create a character that is more you than anything else, but is also being shaped by the 13 other artists in the room? We've talked about kind of how it's been. There were moments of doubt, the universal notes that we've all had to apply to our things. What is that just like from you as the perspective of being an artist, knowing that I'm creating something on my own, but it's also going to be shaped in the final product by what other people are bringing to the table. Um, Maggie, let's start with you. Gosh, I mean, I thought it was so exciting to have this kind of level playing field where we're all in this play, but we're all the same person in this play and the beautiful thing about it is that each of us can bring our own unique idiosyncrasies and (laughs) personality traits and and you know variations in body and things like that to this character and that that makes the character flourish like david is a mega a mega concept right (laughs) David is not just one person. He's like a mega person. Um, So yeah, knowing that there would be these 13 other people all working on this idea of David was just really thrilling for me. Mm. Nice. 
Steph, how's by you? Yeah, I found, um, I found a sense of bravery that I have not had in the room because mm. I was watching other people be brave. I was watching other people be themselves and be and take risks as well as like, I mean, isn't it just the biggest risk to be ourselves in a white suit calling our sister? calling ourselves David, knowing there's a person in 15 minutes who's going to do the same thing, but in an entirely different way. Mm. And that felt, that felt really special to know it. Well, if you can be you, then I can be me and I can be me to the fullest extent because there's that, you know, cheesy Dr. Seuss quote about you are the U.S.U. you. And there's some validity to there's nobody who's going to do this role like me. And if Janae can be the fullest version of her, David, and I have deep respect and admiration, and I try to steal all of her jokes and call them my own, then I can probably be me and people will like that version as well. Absolutely. Janae, for you? Um, the extension of who I am, that's the easy part because I mostly play me or my mom in every play. <laughs> um my right Someday, can you do david as your mom that's, that's a cool it. question it's, it's more <laughs> it's more hands more bent wrists just more fatigue worn out <laughs> <laughs> and snacks uh but um the lovely part about other people playing it i think um i stole something from jess early on and i, and I don't in stand-up comedy it's like, don't steal, be the originator of everything. Mm. You're the first and the only, and nobody steals. And then I was like, oh, I saw Jess make a moment make sense for me, you know, where I didn't need to change the writing. Because I'm so often in a new play, you're like, is this what you intended to write? Or can we change this line a little bit? Because it's not. Mm. Jess made sense of a moment. And I was like, I'm still in that, Jess. Like, I just told her, I was like, I need that. I need that beat. And then I think Amanda sort of encouraged that. Like, I'm stealing stuff from all of you guys. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, well, I'm stealing something else from you. And that was a beautiful blessing yeah. and a freedom to say, okay, why y'all think I'm watching El Sode, watching everybody in El Sodebro uh, on the iPad? I'm like, let me see what they do doing up in here. Let me see Stephanie's work in the room. Let me see. <laughs> You know, I could hear Christina in there. I said, Christina, don't come behind me and my group. Not my group. Like, damn, we want to go back in El Cerebro and see what they're doing. Don't be doing that shit. But I'm going to steal it next time. So it's been a blessing to be able to, to use 13 other wise, talented brains to come up with, like, solutions for this thing. And I totally feel like then I carry... <laughs> I like carry all 13 Davids on my back as I go through the play. Like there's a moment, speaking of Jess, where rather than looking at Joe and saying, thanks, Joe, which I've been doing, the Joes told me, Jess says, thanks, buddy. And they love it. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to call Joe my buddy. <laughs> and so I just told Jess, I was like, I'm doing that. And every time I say it, Joe's going to feel good. And I I'm going to carry a bit of you in my show. Yeah. And that this work can get really lonely because the audience is, is your scene partner and the audience comes and goes. And mm -hmm. I feel like my, my community, it, it really exists in the 15 minutes behind me and the 15 minutes before me. And so it can feel lonely when I'm in a room being like, I hear my other David, like I miss them. And when I get to steal these bits, I'm like, ah, oh, they're here. Like they're mm -hmm. in my show too. And I hope that I'm showing up in their show in some stupid way. And when I hear, yeah, Christina just hollering at the El Cerebro, I'm like, that's my bud. I bet you wish you were in her show. You're not, get over You're it. You're not, you're in mine. So let's you're in mine. keep going. <laughs> She's got the suit, okay? That's She's her. got the suit. Chris, I don't have her suit, all right, everybody? Christina I'm is the embodiment of swag. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got to that. Black. on her birthday like it's the absolute truth like from jump street i'm like oh this is the swaggiest david in the group <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like we can't we're not we're not we can't escape that we just got to sit here and applaud the game that's all we can there's, do there's so much to take from everybody in this oh, show yeah. 
it's like why like I don't know Maggie I listened to your voice the other day and I was like that's lovely on the ears okay let me give him some of this smooth silky right here the dulcet okay. tones of Janae Burris it's like that was, let me get these tones together the people deserve it they deserve it yeah so I take a little from everybody. I'm like, okay, my 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 group deserves a little of that too. A nice yes. tone on the a nice something hitting the ears. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I try and take I try and take some of the uh the the big daddy energy from Donnie. Mm-hmm. I'm want- sorry, Donnie is all of our grandpas. I've <laughs> I've assigned family members to several people in our community. If I'm the creepy Rachel uncle stuff, I'm mom. turning this off. <laughs> what did you say? So much of my stepdad. I said, oh, if I'm the creepy the uncle. About him, no, too. Sam, you're not. <laughs> Donnie is like the, he's like, I've got it under control. Even when things are literally up in flames, I'm like, you know who we should ask what to do? Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> he will lead us. He will lead us into the promise, promised land. I'm just sure of it. Abner's got the joy. I've listened in on his show. And I said, like, yeah, I know. give these people more joy. Excuse me. Don't mm-hmm. be a downer, Burris. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some joy. I, I need that encouragement daily because I'd be coming in like not fully ready the way I used to be before the baby I used to be like after zone and now I don't I just don't have the luxury of the zone I have to lean on the the experience mm-hmm. and just be like you know you got it inside you and just get your ass in there and do it yeah. turn it on ain't no warm-up turn this car on and drive it <laughs> But I heard Abner with the joy. He laughs at the end. This big, I've been trying to copy that, but I'm still a little timid about it. But Abner gives him this, this big laugh at the end that is so joyous. I was like, shit, my audience deserves that too. I've been stealing jokes from James. James is saying some wild. I think James is the funniest person in the show. He's wild. Absolutely. He, somebody, Absolutely. I have a friend who is coming to the show and they said, I will feel too self-conscious if it's you because I know you. So I just chose a different time. And I looked at who's their time and I lit up like Christmas morning because I was like, you're going to see James and you're going to have the best time. Yeah. Bring a chicken sandwich. Bring (laughs) Bring a chicken sandwich, please. The guy's got to eat. Yeah. I, you're absolutely right. I, James has got this quick wit, this mind that his works so fast in a moment. He's just breathtaking. Peter is Loki. He's mischievous, man. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. He plays it up. It's fun. I, I I've been I went through one of his rooms before we opened, and I was like, oh, I'm t- I'm gonna I'm gonna be hey. the sneaky guy in this moment here, just like him. That's so much fun. Oh shit! I didn't get to see Peter. Okay, I gotta go see him. I'm trying to. What I'm gonna try and do um when before we go on our our break on the 18th, I'm gonna try and catch everyone that I haven't seen yet. Do we have a break? But, I mean, we got a couple of days. It's not I big. Just, it's not like you can go to Cancun to... for three weeks. Right. I don't have enough time to go do nothing, so I ain't even counting. I'm like, just, I, leave, I, just leave the baby at home and go to Vegas for a week. It'll be fun. Yeah. Those will be a couple of surprises. I'm like, yay, I could do laundry today. <laughs> also, right. just to give a shout out to the other the other ladies in the house, yes. um, Lisa's show is, I, I think, the most original I told her that I see her mom in moments, I see her dad in moments, and then I see Lisa in moments. And I'm like, how do you do this? Lisa Hori Garcia, who's bringing, you know, yes. flavors from a hundred different places of the world. I'm like, I stole an idea from hers and literally was told, you don't do it as well as Lisa, so you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fine. No. I and then so happy to go Annie, watch. Annie was called Plucky by the New York Times. And I just find her to be this, like, this bird whose eyes I'm like, am I about to get lost in those, in those huge saucer eyes? Mm -hmm. So I just think like, what a freaking group. What a. Uh, Absolutely. What a tornado of, of disastrous talent. Mm. You about to get wrecked, everybody. Good luck. Mm. I've been saying it to any of my friends that don't, um connect to the theater scene all that often i'd be like these are the 14 best actors in colorado yeah, de- but depending on who's making that list any other night this is that bravado i talked about earlier coming up you can you can see that you can make your own list your own order to it these are the 14 best 
They're, they all bring something very unique and beautiful to each moment. I do feel quite privileged. I, I know that um, Maggie was talking about it before. I feel quite privileged and my feet hurt in them damn shoes. Ooh. And I remind myself, even though my feet hurt, what a privilege it is to have been chosen for this. You know, as 14 sounds large, that ain't that many. So it's what a privilege to be part of this cast, to be in this play and to have this opportunity. And I'm, I have this time away from my kid and I feel a little guilty about it, but I'm like, also he could be proud of me because I'm proud of myself. And I'm like, look at me, live in the dream, okay? Ezra Sutton <laughs> has got the example set on how to be a dominant energy in a room, give a damn, a huge damn about a family and carry all that at the same time and not miss a yeah. beat. Totally. Oh, yeah. So, Let's make sure he listens to this when he's 18 and yelling at you about borrowing the car. Oh, just put the headphones on him tomorrow. He'll get it. Oh, oh I do try to keep him like, you know, stay focused. Watch me right now. Because I know you'll get your own life soon, but watch what I'm doing. But you know, for to all those kids who went to theater school or went to a theater program, you know, we are doing the thing, y'all. Pat yourselves on the back. Like, you know, Steph, I know you're talking about this idea of like what success looks like as a performer and an artist. It can be so devastating for us, for introverts, extroverted introverts, and um, to the ego, to the creativity. It can be devastating when we start to compare ourselves to each other and we see our friends from school in movies and getting awards and shit. And it's like, no, I'm living the dream. I'm performing for a fucking living. I'm doing a play written by extraordinary people who've been researching it for years and people, it's wild what we get to do. And it's a privilege to be part of this small select group of people who get to be in this show right now. Like this is- You're not lying. You're not lying. Um, I, I got a couple more questions before we wrap this up. Uh, I want to touch on something that I've just kind of gotten the vibe just just on my own, looking at this this project, the the 15 minutes a new person comes in this cycle. I, I, I wonder, does does this get a little commoditized? and distilled on the schedule that's at or is this a sustainable way to to put on theater especially immersive work where i kind of feel the business is going to go i think there's something to be said about it only being 16 people mm -hmm. and how that number i don't know how they chose that number but that number it actually feels like we connect individually like I connect with each individual 16 and they connect with one another by the end I think if it was any bigger that would be really challenging and if it was any smaller you feel a little afraid of what are the rules am I doing the right thing at the right time is the spotlight too much on me mm -hmm. and I think you know we we all start the show the same way which I will keep a secret but I'm like, I'm getting ready to start the show. And I'm like, all right, all right, here we go. Here we go. Breathing, like rolling the shoulders back, like getting ready. And then the moment begins. And I'm like, whoa, that I've never seen these people before. I have no idea what they're going to give me. I have, it, it, it starts to feel rote until the moment the show starts mm. where it's like, yeah, I look at my Google calendar before the week. And I'm like, all right, I got this on this day. And I'll show up at this time, sure. And then the show begins and you just can't be on autopilot with this work because those people are looking in your eye being like, what is next? Most of them. Yeah, most of them. <laughs> yeah, if I could give, if there's anybody who has not seen the show and I could give two bits of advice, look us in the eye and answer our questions when we ask them directly to you. <laughs> if you do those two things, you're going to have a hell of a time. And so are we. Mm -hmm. Um. So I just think it's a really good number. And I think it ends up being more special than I thought it would be. And 12 is a lot of shows a week, which is what we're doing right now. And yet I feel by the 12th show that I am not spent because of the push and the pull. So I think 
uh, I hope more theater moves to immersive. I think it's really risky. And I think theater could afford, both literally afford, and so it doesn't die to aff afford to take some risks. And I think immersive is really risky. And I think people really wanna be seen right now. And this feels like a very safe way to be seen and to either leave it at the play or to seek it out in their relationships. I, I I just wanna just wanna echo what you just said. People seeking the being seen. I love that they would come to a piece, a performance art piece, to have that experience. Because I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of this uh, screaming into the void that seems to be so much of how we process media is is also an effort to be seen and to be validated or at the very least have a conversation as to why our belief system may or may not be the way to go about things and to be in a room maggie you touched on the different perspectives that that we kind of shed light on during the evening as as audiences come through and what they then take for themselves it, that's that's a beautiful point that i hadn't honestly thought about is that we sought this we it's um those i mean it's like the burt lancaster monologue in field of dreams mm. I, put the, I, put the, I don't I, i'm giving them the money to buy a ticket and i don't even know why and then i'm in the room and i smell these things you smell things and then i hear these things because you hear these things and then you see this story unfold in front of you and well, there's never a mirror that you really get to check into unless you crane your neck backstage. You get to see yourself in a different way, I think, afterwards. That, thank you, Steph. That's a great point. I um, think we really want, it's the reason we go to movie theaters. It's the reason we go work in coffee shops. It's the reason we go to theater. It's the reason we go to baseball games. We want to have a collective experience with, and, with strangers and with friends. We want to do it with both groups. And we have to create these spaces where we get out of our houses and we do it because it reminds us we're not alone. And that person is different than me. We're having a similar experience. We are connected in our differences and in our sameness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Maggie, do you have a feeling on, on this type of work that we've been doing? Do you feel that there's a commoditization that's distilling the work here or no? I mean, uh, yeah, I would agree with Steph that it's risky, but it's sure paying off right now, right? We just got extended, um, which is awesome. Yay for theater of the mind, yay for off center. Um, what a thrilling thing that it's such a success. Um, I think that when you take it down from, you know, one stage and 5,000 people in the audience, to one room and one actor and 16 people and no screens. Nobody looks at a phone for an hour. I don't look at a phone for an hour. That is one of the things I love about doing this show. It's just us. It's just us human beings being together. Yes, there's all this amazing technology happening around us, but at the end of the day, it's a human experience and it's a human connection. And I think that's why people love it so much, you know, Absolutely. it, 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 Sko said this at some point in rehearsals, he was like, you know, what takes this from being something kind of really cool to something extraordinary is the human connection of it, the humanity of it. Mm. And so I don't think if he, I don't think it can be commodified Mm -hmm. so much I mean you just you do need that every 15 minutes to make the whole thing work right yeah. <laughs> um so maybe it's theater working I it's just different you know it's it's different than what you're gonna go and see at the Buell um and it's just as valuable in my opinion yeah yeah absolutely I think I mean you you touched on it the this this extension does in a way feel like a rewarding of the hard work that not only we the actors have put into this piece but i mean the years that were spent 
from the directors to the creators to the producers to the staff behind the scenes to getting stage managers on board training the eas and all of that the costumers the work that they're putting in and like there may be a sense of man it's time to move on to the next project but this in and of itself is a great reward that we've all earned and i'm I'm glad that you touched on that very much thank you um what has been up to this point one of your favorite discoveries you've made in the room you don't have to without spoiling any part of the journey what is something that like you had the show open for a while you've been doing the show it's been feeling great each time but then bam out of nowhere you got hit with something new what it, it could even it could be the most recent thing but what's that moment you're like oh man that was great i'll get the ball rolling last week i was doing a show i think i'd done like a couple of nights in a row and i was tired it was the third run and i was doing my final bit and I put my hand on a chair and I felt the chair for like the, I I realized in the moment you've never touched a chair. Like you've never actually put your hand on a chair. And then I, I, I felt that I had that thought. And then I was like, my grandmother sat in a chair just like this. Like, a, like an older version of what we provide the audience for this particular moment. And then, but the, the way the material is stitched felt the same way as this chair that had cigarette butt burns in it. That was right next to a table that had, you know, her, her glass of, of Bloody Mary that she had, and the cigarette, the ashtray. And I was there. I was there in my grandmother's living room back at her old house in Michigan having that that tactile experience and just like looking into the eyes of somebody as I talk to them about what we what I see life to be then I, then all of a sudden I started bawling I just just wrecked because of that new discovery there's a moment in the show where the audience gets to share some experiences of their own mm. and it feels like a very comfortable space to share secrets some of the time. Mm -hmm. And a woman shared a story that was very cool. And at the end, she said, I I stopped telling people because people stopped believing me. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to say to her, well, thank you for sharing. I believe you. And then a voice that I don't, know who it came from I don't think the woman who initially told the story knew where it came from that voice said well I believe you Mm. and those are the moments that we chase after not just me being the conduit of all these 16 connections but saying you might not have met like Maggie was just talking about in the first 10 seconds you don't think you know each other but I'm giving you an invitation that you do and you can trust these people and you can trust me and we're just going to do this together and when those connections start happening where we do not have to be the connection point that feels otherworldly that to me is the microcosm of what the world needs as a macro saying you're across the room i don't know you i don't know the rest of your story but i'm telling you right now i believe your experience that's that's wonderful Damn. Maggie, how about you? I mean, yes, in this in this moment in the show when people mention <clears throat> certain things and it's 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 such a beautiful bonding moment. And a man um talked about being pronounced dead and coming back to life. And it was just astounding. And I said after that, like, we are so glad you're here. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that, um, experience where there is this potentiality for the audience to share is quite amazing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Janae, how about you? 
I just something I learned from James uh, in in the second to last space that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's probably the least interactive space, <laughs> and everybody tries to interact with that space. And I used to get in a panic of like, don't touch that, don't open it, don't don't sit there, don't. Ah! And I mm. felt this panic. And I learned from James that like, it's not a big deal. <laughs> Somebody, one of our stage managers will reset the space. Um, and so I started to recently interact with the space myself. So, and then Betty gave me, Betty watched me yesterday and gave me the note that I kept everybody's attention. And so people weren't, you know, trying to take over the space themselves. Mm. And I, so that was, that was a cool discovery that I just made. I was like, oh, why is this whole time I have been panicking in that space to like control everybody? And it was like, use your acting skills, honey. Like, bring their attention over here. Ezra says, bedtime. <laughs> We're almost there, Ezra, I swear, I swear. Um, before I get into our last question, I'm going to say this right now. I am absolutely stealing that, Janae and James. I don't do that in that room that you're talking about. And I do, and I go into this speed, nervous energy, hoping things don't happen. And then I go <laughs> as soon as I can. The but door, it, it, check mm. the space yourself. Yeah. Use the space yourself before nice. they start using the space. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm the one who. This is my memory. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Was... Absolutely, that's a great. That's a great point. It's so funny how I think about this piece, and then how hard I work on certain things, and then just you get so fixated on specific beats or moments and choices, blah blah blah, approaches, and then something like that happens. You're like, holy crap! Of course that would work. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everyone for being with me tonight. Before we sign off, the ghost lights always ask, what is that ghost light you wish was left on for you that you leave on for the next generation of actors, artists coming up behind you? It can be about this piece if you'd like the it to be. big philosophical question, Sam. So let me, yeah. That is so Sam. This is oh, I'm going to hit you with it. I'm going to hit you with it because life's too short, Janae. I can we see always get the roses in, in the wind, the why, Sam. What is the ghost like? <laughs> yes, ghost okay. Man. Bring it. I don't have an answer. I'm listening. All right, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I would say to anyone out there, remember your own value. I think that I have struggled with my own worthiness as an actor, as a woman, as a person, and a whole heck of a lot more once I became disabled, feeling that I am unworthy, right? But we are all valuable. We all have something beautiful and unique to offer. Bravo. Absolutely. Mine is a little bit of a two-parter. I really believe in more seats at the table, in seats that I, that don't look like me, that don't have my experience, that don't understand my experience, putting all of those experiences and identities at the table to mm. create. And then to do that, I think we need to get wherever we are to reach behind us and say, who can I pull up beside me? So if there are not enough seats, there, there is an infinite amount of creation of seats. So whoever is before us, we just need more arms back. We need more, more pulling towards and saying, there is room for you here. Just like Maggie said, we all have value. My experience is not the only valuable experience. So if I am in a room, I can create a seat. I can create a new table. I can reach behind me and pull somebody there. I can take somebody before me and say, we need you back at this table right now because we need your experience. And the more we have different experiences, different values, different looking people, 
in the creation, in the boots on the ground work, the better our art will be, the more inclusive it will be, sometimes the more specific, but no matter what, people will feel I belong here because somebody who understood me created this experience with me in mind. Mm -hmm. And and I would even say doing that work that you spoke of, Steph, is also a reach back. Yeah. Absolutely. Janae, yeah, what, what versions have? of myself need to also be included at this table? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to squeeze it in because baby's given up on me. Um, <laughs> I think both of those were great. I think my sort of like Maggie's. Um, oh, you know what? Here's something I, I want to leave. I think if I'm understanding the question from the from the late great Charlie Miller. No, he's not late great. But he's great. He's got old man name and he's like the youngest person in the room, which is he's like young and wise and it's got an old man's name, probably like a Charlie Miller. Wouldn't you imagine that's an older person? But I always want to say it like um like Rick James and the Dave Chappelle show. <laughs> Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller. What's his what's his title now with off center? executive um, producer oh is that what it is it's the next two. But anywho, charlie, let's do some fact checking while we talk um charlie told me after between us in an exit interview um what, what, what i asked i said if i had to do over again i would have asked for some days certain days off so i could um go do some stand-up and kind of have you know both incomes and he was like, you know, when you're wanted for a show or you wanted for a project, people want to work with you, you can ask for whatever you want. You can ask. And I had never thought to ask. Absolutely. And so um, oh, yeah. to leave that light in the space for the next generation, you can ask, you have value. Like Maggie said, you are unique. You have a unique value to offer. Um, and you can ask for things. And I think I spent many, many years never asking and just trying to make it all work. As an artist, you just feel like you have to make it work. And it's like, nah, you gotta ask. You have value. People want to work with you. So nobody's gonna kick you out just because you ask for something. And the last show I did actually with Amanda. Amanda cast me in a show when I had hella conflicts and I was pregnant. And I was like, nobody, also nobody could wear perfume. Uh, you know, she still cast me. She worked around my dates. And I. it took me years to learn that. It took me till Charlie Miller to learn that. Yeah. So I'd leave that for the next generation. That's true words are rarely spoken. In person. You're absolutely right. It's a, And I love that it's a connection of thoughts, too. I feel like throughout the asking for spaces at the table making those spaces mm -hmm. knowing our worth our value and asking for the things that we need in order to take care of ourselves as we talked about earlier in this pod we and and, and it this isn't just exclusive to artists a lot of us work in spaces and we give so much of ourselves whether we love the job or not there are a lot of extenuating circumstances that provide or should say that push us in a specific direction, right? And sometimes love isn't part of that equation. And to know who we are, what we bring to the table and have value in that and love that about ourselves at the very least, if we're not getting it in what it is that we're pursuing is something to be applauded. We create that stuff for ourselves because no matter what job you carry, it matters. It does matter. Even if it doesn't feel like it, if it feels like it's a bump in the road, it's a Joe job to get you to point B, that's exactly what it is. It's a part of the journey. Don't, don't poo-poo that. Love yours. Um, Steph Lombo, Maggie Whittem, Janae Burris. These are just three of the amazing team bringing you theater of the mind every night, but Monday over at the yards on York yards on York, get your tickets. We are now extended through January 22nd. I can't thank you enough for being with me tonight, carving out some time to talk about this process, your process and your journey, because it does matter. And I just, you know, I do this podcast because I want to make better friends. 
ghosties it's the ghost lights podcast it's episode 99 dan do the damn thing